Hey, good morning. Um, it is just after 8 a.m. We have folks coming in through the waiting room, um, but in the interest of time, we're going to kick it off and get started. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today for this Farm Filings Tax Series. <clears throat> um, in today's session, we're going to be joined by accounting professionals, uh, Christy Snyder and Daniel Cothard of Compere Financial to help teach us about the importance of record keeping. Um, first, I do wanna briefly cover the Zoom housekeeping. If you are unfamiliar with the Zoom rules, then congratulations, you have not been getting enough Zoom in. Um, our, the way we wanna do this is to keep everybody, um, everybody keep their video off so we can make the most of our bandwidth and keep your microphone muted while the presentation is going on. If you do have questions <clears throat> during our presentation, you can use the chat box, which you can find by navigating your cursor to the bottom of your Zoom screen. You should get a little bar of tools that pop up and there should be a little chat icon. If you press that, a pop-out box will appear to your right, um, and you can you can chat to the entire group, or you can even chat to your buddies if you find them in the list. Um, if you have questions during our presentation, please feel welcome to drop your chats or your questions into the chat box at any time. We will be saving the questions till the end of the presentation. Um, I am your host. I'm Cassidy Delorto Blackwell the Farmer Training Program Manager here at The Land Connection based in Champaign, Illinois, and serving farmers in eatings throughout our state and beyond. Um, our mission is to train farmers in resilient restorative farming techniques, inform the public about the sources of our food and why that matters, <clears throat> and work to protect and enhance farmland so that we and generations to come will have clean air and water, fertile soil and healthy, delicious food. Um, and I invite you to please visit us online at thelandconnection.org. You can sign up for our newsletter and find out about all of our upcoming happenings. I'd also like to thank um, Roots to Farm who has made this series possible. Um, the Roots to Farm Alliance is a collaborative effort of Organizations committed to providing resources to farmers growing their food businesses in the Chicago Food Shed. Um, you can find out more about Roots to Farm by visiting them at rootstofarm.org. And finally, a very big thank you to our 2021 farmer training sponsors. Without them, we would not be able to do this work. So thank you so much. And now to the main event. Um, we are joined today by Christy and Daniel of Compure Financial. Um, Compure Financial is a member-owned farm credit cooperative serving and supporting agricultural and rural communities. They provide loans, leases, risk management, and other financial services such as tax and accounting throughout 144 counties in Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, Christy Snyder has been with Farm Credit for nine years she lives in Sauk County, Wisconsin. She has a master's in business administration with a concentration in accounting and over 16 years of experience as an accountant. Uh, Daniel Clothard has been with Farm Credit for six years. He lives in Dane County, Wisconsin, and he has a Bachelor of Science in Dairy, he has a Bachelor of Science degree in Dairy Science and a Bachelor of Arts in Accounting. So thank you very much. Uh, Christy and Daniel for joining us. And I'm going to hand it over to you at this time. Let me see. All right. Thank you, Cassidy. Good morning. Um, we're going to talk about intro to record keeping. So the next slide, we'll talk about the business structures. Um, so a sole proprietor, a C-corp, an S-corp, and a partnership are your 
familiar ones for tax purposes. A sole proprietor is owned by one person. A C Corp, it has multiple owners to it. S Corp, the same. In partnership, more than one person. So a sole proprietor, um, one of the things that you want to be careful about is, you know, it's one of the things that's the easiest to set up. However, you're personally on the hook for anything that the business might have for liabilities. A C corporation, you can deduct fringe benefits for the owners. There's a flat, flat tax rate. And unfortunately, there's a double taxation for it. So you get taxed on the corporation side and you also get taxed for your own individual or the owner's side as well. For an asset corporation, your profit losses pass through to your shareholders or the owners. So you don't get taxed on the corporation side, but you do on your own income tax side. For partnerships, there's a lot more flexibility. You avoid the double taxation, just like in the S Corp. So the losses and profits flow through to the partners. And then there's LLC, which is more of a hybrid entity that combines the flexibility of the partnership, but gives you limited liability protection of a corporation. So with the corporations, you just are more protected in case there's liability and uh, you're not really on the hook for those things. So the next slide. We'll be talking about uh, cash versus accrual accounting. Um, for cash accounting, revenue is recognized when money is actually received. Expenses recognized when they are paid. So as you deposit money into the bank, that's when it is recognized. And then when the checkout and mailing vendor, that's when the expense is recognized. On the reverse side, accrual basis accounting is revenue and expenses that are recorded when they are earned, not when the money is actually received. So when you are invoicing um, for something, for your revenue, um, you probably, like if you've got custom hire that maybe you're doing on the side and you're invoicing for it, um, that would be recognized at that moment and not necessarily when you receive the cash. So, and then your accounting method is stated on your tax return. I'm sorry, Dan, you're, Dan, you're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes. So Dan brings up a good point with most farmers are cash basis. Um, usually if your revenue is under $25 million, uh, you would use cash basis. Usually accrual basis is for if you're doing, um, if any over 25 million or you're selling directly to customers, some sort of retail or something like that. All right, um, next slide, please. We'll just start um, with the chart of accounts. I'm not sure um, how familiar you guys are with the chart of accounts or if you have your own software that you might be tracking your record keeping or books on, but the chart of accounts is very important in how you set it up. You really want it to be where it's easy for you to relate to, but it's also got all the necessary accounts on it. Um, so you can run reports or take it to your tax person for taxes. You would wanna make sure like you have all the different general ledger accounts that you would need for that. So for the balance sheet accounts, you have your assets, which is your checking, savings, fixed assets, co-op stocks, and items such as that. 
liabilities, you have your notes payable, you have other loans, your payroll tax liabilities, and then you have your owner's equity or retained earnings, which is the money or property that the owner puts into the business, net what they take out of the business. So income statement accounts would be revenue, which is your sales, your patronage refunds, rental income, custom higher income, um, your expenses, feed, vet, utilities, supplies, repairs, fuel, really the things that you are buying to run your farm or agribusiness. And then a little bit deeper dive into those. Next slide, please. Um, is your balance sheet a snap? A balance sheet is a snapshot of your current financial situation. It's everything that is owned, everything that is owed. Um, it's got your assets on it that we just talked about. You've got your current assets, which are assets you can convert to cash in your normal operating um, cycle, usually within a year. Then you have your intermediate assets that are more than a year to convert to cash. And then you have your long-term assets, which are longer than one year. And that's like your land, your buildings and items such as that. Liabilities are the same. Those would be um, if they're due within 12 months or a year, they're your current liabilities, intermediate liabilities would be, they would be within 10 years to pay. And then your long-term is anything that's past 10 years debt to pay on. Also, there's two different kinds when you look at that balance sheet. This kind of balance sheet is not going to match your tax balance sheet. Your tax balance sheet is everything that at the current value that you purchased it, where this balance sheet will be um, current, a lot of current values of and current situations of your products that you have in storage or whatever to possibly sell yet with the current prices. Okay, and then on to the income statement. Income statement is your revenues and expenses from operating and non-operating activities. It shows a process profit, sorry about that, or loss for a certain period of time. So that's got your income, your operating expenses, depreciation, and then you get your net profit or loss from your income statement. Okay, and then next slide. A repair versus a capitalized one. Um, so questions to ask yourself is the expense necessary and routine? Is it in the same working condition as it was prior to the repair? Did you keep it in operating condition for normal use? If, you're, if any of those are yes, then it is a repair. And then on the other side is the expense for betterment, adaption, or restoration. Betterment is materially increasing the value. Adaption is changing it to a different or new use. And restoration is returning it back to normal state of operation after falling into a state of despair. So then you would capitalize it. In order to have accurate accounting, you really need all of your documents that you're utilizing within the business accounted for. You'd have your monthly bank statement, your duplicate checks, your check images or checkbook register, anything you're keeping your tally on, um, credit card statements, invoices that need to be split, example, your co-op bill, receipts for items paid in cash, deposit receipts, closing statements for land purchases or sales, sales agreement, financing agreement for equipment or vehicle purchases, prior year ending loan balances, 
uncleared checks and deposits for bank accounts, capital assets, and then prior year tax return. And then organizing those records, you know, you really want a filing system that's really going to work for you. Um, keep it simple, fit it to your own farm business needs. You know, is that by vendor, month, income, expense account, capital purchases, capital sales, your employees, if you have any, custom hire for your vendors. Um, if you do it by computer and you have your computer records, make sure to keep a backup file at another location, just in case something might happen to it. Filing cabinet, keep day-to-day -day information easily accessible in case you've got to go back and review something or look something up. You really want it to be somewhere where you can just go and get it. Okay, and then next slide. This is some document retention rules. You know, you want to keep your records for three years. You want to keep your records for three years from the date you filed original return or two years from the date you paid the tax. Keep your records for seven years if you file a claim or loss from worthless securities or bad debt deduction. Keep records for six years. If you do not report income, that should be. Keep records indefinitely if you do not file a return or if you file a fraudulent return because they can go back as long as they want once they find something is fraudulent. Um, keep employment tax records for at least four years after the date that the tax becomes due or paid, whichever is later. Keep records relating to property until the period of limitations expires for one year in which you dispose of the property. So it's very important to hold on to those items. That is not something that you would only just keep for seven years. You would definitely wanna keep on. Keep that so that you have that in case there's any questions about it or you have to look something up on it. And then next slide. And then your tax return supporting documents. Those can be audited up to three years. So you will want to keep those in your file. If large errors are found, IRS can go back a total of six years. So that's why they say keep it for seven years because it's the current year plus prior six years. Examples of some of those supporting documents are 1099s, K1s, auto mileage logs, if you're keeping track of your mileage for any trucking expense, bank statements, business credit card statements, income documents, stubs, so your patronage co-op stubs, your livestock check stubs, um, your milk settlement sheets, um, expense receipts, invoices, brokerage statements, hard copies of your computerized records. So if you've got it on a computer, you definitely want to be able to pull those reports if necessary for those certain periods of time if it's audited. And then your W-2s as well. Next slide. Capital purchases and sales, your purchase invoices, your contracts, closing statements, any other statements that document a purchase need to be kept for seven years and after the item is sold or disposed of. Example is your equipment, your land, your home, other improvements you may have had, remodeling, conservation, fencing, clearing. All those items are just examples of some of the things that you would want to hold on to and keep in case there's any reason that they would need to look back at them. And then for employee forms, if you have employees, you will want to keep the W-4s for at least four years after filing the fourth quarter for the year. The same with the state WT-4, the state withholding. You'll wanna keep that for four years after filing the fourth quarter for the year as well. And then the federal form I-9, which is your verification of citizenship 
is needs to be able to be kept for three years after the date of hire or one year after employment ends, whichever is later. So that just is a form to keep on file that says they can work here. So. All right. And then do we have any questions? Yeah, let's see. I'm gonna have to stop the share because I cannot see anything. Um, okay. Um, we have one question from uh, Michaela. If you receive a check, but don't deposit it for a couple of weeks for the for the cash method of accounting, you would wait until you make the deposit, correct? I assume they mean in terms of like logging it into your statement. I feel like Dan, you've got an opinion. <laughs> uh, if you could unmute. No. Can you search your name in the participants? Well, I can answer um, that question too. And if Dan wants to add to it, he can. Um, you would, yes, you would re record it when you deposit. However, you do have to be careful that if you received it in a certain year and could have deposited in the bank, you still have to count that as income. You can't save it and put it in a different year. So all the people that sell corn or cash grain and they need a further income, they should have those checks dated January 1 versus December, unless they're late and they say it was in the mail. That's why it's kind of one of them, uh, how, you, how you track it and how you record everything. So from that perspective on everything. But if you receive it and have it in your presence, um, you should count it in that calendar year, yes. Um, I've got another one in here. How long should you keep a W-9 for? I would keep it on file for as long as you're doing business with the, the, the vendor that you are currently operating with. Um, they may change over time and you may have to update. Um, that's why you'll see occasionally um, vendors send out their information every three, four years just to update their records so they have it on file. Um, if they want to go back and check those records, uh, that, that's why they're there. That's why you do it to protect yourself on your end of uh, the operation. That makes sense. Um, got another one from Sh Sharon. Um, so she's just starting off. Should she set up a separate bank account? And how does that work if you're, if you're paying yourself? Um, should she set up as an LLC right away? Or do you have other advice? Um, well, I guess I don't know the certain situation of um, the business or the LLC that possibly would be getting formed, but you definitely, it's a good idea to have a separate checking account that if you're going to do a lot of personal items from, you may want your own personal then to stay your personal and then just use the business one for the entity. You know, it really depends on what kind of entity you are having, like corporations, you really should have a separate checking account for any separate corporation or entity. Um, you can pay yourself out of any of your business ones. They're just draws or your own equity draw on the business. So you can make um, cash withdrawals from them, but it is a good idea to just um, have a separate one. That way you can keep your expenses and your deposits separate from maybe what you have going on personally. It keeps things a lot cleaner than um, to mix and match your business with personal. Sure, can you, can you maybe give a little bit more explanation about what it means when you take an owner's draw and like how you should be recording that? It depends on um, how it's set up. 
if you're like a simple sole proprietor, it would just be considered like a family living draw. And, you know, you're taking money out of the business um, to pay yourself basically for your living expenses on your personal side. Um, partnerships in that are equal for each partner based on everything that's set up according to the articles of incorporation or articles um, for the business operation. Uh, with all that, you want to keep everything. But with that, it's kind of basically your living expenses, what you anticipate for you to live on personally. And you're just taking it out of the business. And then that is not taxed on the uh, business side, but it's taxed to you personally on your 1040. So it's, it's just kind of one of them, how you want to get the money out. If you don't have a personal, that's why you'll see a lot of people when uh, you do records and everything that every, you got to go through every detail because you don't know then if it's personal or if it's business related um, for the operation. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. You have good advice. Always keep all your records um, and clearly label what they're for. Um, we've got another one. <clears throat> um, receipts, uh, Rachel says, receipts generally come in a mix of electronic and paper copies. Do you recommend that they should be scanned and printed so all receipts are available in both formats? Or are businesses generally moving to everything just being electronic? Um, to clarify, she just wants to know, is it okay to only have electronic and no paper records for receipts? Yes, I mean, it really is up to you on how you want to keep your receipts or invoices. As long as you have a copy to produce, if you're ever audited, there's any questions as to what your expenses are or where that number is coming from, it can be electronic or it can be paper file. That's why you'll see a lot of businesses as they grow, even they, when they still get paper copies, they have everything scanned in. So then they can destroy the paper copies and keep it on a computer record. Um, for those records and then make sure they got a backup off site or wherever. So that way in the event of um, catastrophic computer failure, they still have their records um, stored somewhere. Yeah, good call. Um, and does, do you guys have feelings about like cloud-based, um, keeping your records in the cloud as a, you know, to, as, a, as a way to avoid having to have multiple places to keep those? Um. Well, I guess we don't really um, have an opinion one way or another because it really is up to um, the individual business owner what they would like or what they would prefer. And it also depends on, you know, maybe what they're using it for or how they want access to it. If they want access to it, no matter where they're located or where they are for the day, then maybe they want a cloud base. Um, if they don't mind, it really just doesn't matter as long as you have records. You know, we have different clients that really like QuickBooks and they're using QuickBooks online and they really like that because they can work on stuff there and then they can also give us permissions to work on things as well. So it really is up to the individual needs and preference of each owner. Excellent. Thanks. Um, Courtney asks, is there a time limit for paying yourself back? for a member loan to an LLC. Is that a repayment of a member? Is that repayment of the member loan tax-free? If it's a loan to, so you're saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, you as a partner have taken out a loan from the business because you need to borrow the money at a, a certain period of time. Um, that would be set up with the partners it should be paid back and if you're going to have to pay back interest um you know do you want to pay it back monthly quarterly uh, on a yearly basis or a lump sum when it's all due um it's kind of entirely up to you and the partners how um you want it to get back in because also the, you got to realize that the operation may be counting on that as the money coming back into the business um for it to operate and is there a tax implication for those kinds of internal loans? The only internal is if the interest that you pay back um, would maybe be taxable on that and if, however you want to look at it from that perspective. Um, but to giving you an extra loan out 
is not going to give you any extra tax implications because you would just go on your balance sheet as a uh, loan to partner. Okay. Um, Michael asks if if you're a husband and wife filing jointly, would could you be a sole proprietorship? Is that a sole proprietorship, or is that something that you need to formalize? It's a single member LLC. Uh, with uh, what is it? It, that would be a disregarded entity um, sole proprietorship, or from that way because it's a farmer or a husband and wife operation. There's no outside influence other than the husband and wife um, operating the the the, op, the business. So if that's what you're looking at from that perspective. I can't. I mean, Michael, if you want to clarify. Don't know. <laughs> but we'll let's move on. Um, uh, so Nancy has a question. So she's a little confused. You say it's a good idea to have a separate business account. She learned you should have a separate account in case you ever, in case you're ever audited by the IRS. Is it really just a good idea? Um, is either one okay? Is it how important is it to have your separate account? For your business it's a wise decision to make but a lot of times what happens is um, when you initially start a business you just using your own income your own your own checking account and, was, and that i mean eventually as your business grows and everything yes put it out and get it out get it in its own business name and everything but a lot of times when you start your own business it's kind of one of them um, you want to start it, you want to see where it grows before everything, before, um, for some people, it's um, a headache for transferring funds back and forth and that separate and straight. So, um, but yes, it is a very wise decision to separate it. But a lot of times it's um, from the decision of making when you start that to um, going down the road to after you're established. All right. Um, Courtney has some clarification on the question about the um, about paying your about the the internal loan. So she, she was posing it as um, thinking more like if they loan money to the LLC to help pay the bills and wants to get it returned to them. So that's still just going to be it based on the agreements that you come to with your partners. Yeah, and if you loan money and you want to, you can set it up that you get paid back 1%, 2% interest or whatever, then uh, you may receive a 1099 from the uh, corporation or partnership business, whatever the entity may be, to you for borrowing the money. Like uh, you would receive it at your end from um, uh, the banks stating how much interest you had paid. Okay. Um if you, uh, Chef Fresh asks, if you're a single member LLC, is there a point where things are too complicated where it makes sense to file some other way besides on your personal taxes with a different schedule of attachments? So I think what she's saying is, um, if she's filing as a single member LLC, but as just an addition to her personal income taxes. I'm not sure if I understand entirely. That would be the disregarded entity. I mean, oh. have it float your uh, tax for me. But if it's something that where you're looking at more protection, then you may have it uh, later on derived where you set everything up and file a separate. Uh, tax return for that. Okay, um, here's another LLC question um, about the owner's draws um, from Chef Fresh and Rachel. Um, you mentioned that owner's draws are taxed as personal income for the person drawing the money. Uh, Rachel's understanding is that single owner LLCs are taxed on business income, whether they take an owner's draw or not. Is that correct? Yeah, you're going to be taxed on whatever income you get 
from your business. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, that's all the questions we have in the chat box right now. Do If you have continuing uh, questions, we still have time here. So if you wanna drop in your questions, we are, we're here to answer. Or I should say Christy and Dan are here to answer. <laughs> Okay, Chef Revsh has a follow up. Um, I'm thinking about when it makes sense to file business taxes separately versus the way you file when you are a disregarded entity is to just file your personal taxes. I'm thinking once you start having employees or any complicated income, you're not taking your owner's draw, et cetera. So I guess just, just wondering when when does it make sense to stop doing the disregarded entity situation? Well, it depends on if you're adding partners or changing the business structure of your business. So uh, you, if that's how it's set up and it is operated, fine, you're broken to file that way. But if your business structure gets more complicated, you may have to change your whole um, business setup. You know, if you bring in partners or whatever, and then the whole filing it taxes could change. So until that happened, you know, you start out as a LLC and you've grown and you continue to grow, you may put it into a corporation or whatever with uh, multiple owners or business partners. And then it's becomes, you know, just your wage what you've taken from that to your personal return. Great. I hope we I hope we answered it, Chef. Um, Nikayla has another question. Um, do you have resources about how to classify different expenses, um, like supplies versus depreciation? I know you all have a, quite a bit of resources on your website, but do you have those sorts of specific things? On how to, I'm sorry, on how to classify expenses? Yes. And I guess there's also depreciation is included in that. And does that get classified as an expense or how do you manage that? Well, it would be, um, so you have your normal operating expenses that you'd be keeping track of, you know, whether that's supplies or that's repair and maintenance or, you know, fuel or any of those items, fertilizer, feed. Um, but then depreciation is after that line item. So that would be depreciation would then, it would reduce your revenue is what it's doing. Right, yeah. Um, Just another thing to reiterate on that, you wanna keep things kind of simple from your base. You can separate it out deeper, like your seeds, if you wanna go uh, corn, oat, rye, whatever, or whatever you may be planning, but just remember when if everything flows, it's to the seed and plant. If you wanna do more in-depth analysis of what you're um, planning, dealing with, still code it as seed, but you can create subcategories of your main expenses. So that way it still flows there, but if you wanna uh, keep track of everything that you are dealing with from a standpoint of um, want to do is this line of seed, crop, whatever you're dealing with profitable for me, um, just break it out underneath your main category. So that way you've got that analysis to deal with at a later time. Excellent. Um, and I would say too, um, like I mentioned, Compere does have quite a few resources on their website as do we, if you go to the landconnection.org. We also just launched a self-directed online course all about financial risk management. Um, so you can definitely check that out if you have some free time. Um, and it includes a, a lot of these sorts of discussions. Um, 
Yadi asks, are there any specific tax benefits for setting up a business as an L3C rather than an LLC? I don't know any, I would have to go into it deeper to find out what the, if there is any difference benefit wise to um, the situation and how it was set up. So I would have to do a bigger dive into that to know that right offhand. Yeah, that could be something that you visit with your tax preparer, your tax accountant too, because they're gonna know your situation and kind of what you wanna accomplish with your farm business or agribusiness, so. And when, you're, and when you're setting up, if you're looking at LLCs or partnerships and that, make sure uh, the attorney that you're dealing with from a legal perspective, um, you're also dealing with your tax preparer so they know um, what the best situation for you are within everything. You don't want to set up one way and then get to the tax time and find out it's all wrong. Um, it's kind of when you're setting things up, work with the, um, the legal advice from your attorney and that, and then make sure from a tax end of it, how that will all portray back to you from a tax perspective. You don't want to set up wrong and then have to deal with it and go back and uh, change everything. Yeah. So we have a few other questions in that same vein. Um, Christine asks, what amount of revenue should an LLC consider, okay. what amount of revenue should an LLC considering filing for business registration application with the State Department of Revenue? Whew, I'm not sure if I can read this. Uh, if, have, if you're setting up business registration, well, the majority of it would deal with um, wages. So on that, we're going to get a withholding number for um, state withholding in that. So, I mean, if you have one employee and you're, you know, employing and paying him fifteen thousand or at a minimum wage that way, uh, you're still going to need to set up a bit of tax registration for that. And here's another one in that same vein. Um, Chef Fresh has. I see if he, people file as an S corp when they're single member owners and say there's a better benefit to doing that than a disregarded entity. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on that? So well, the only thing is they might be filing as an S-Corp because they don't want the personal liability that they could hold on it. So otherwise they're all the profit and loss from what the S-Corp has is flowing through to your own income taxes. Right, so yeah, so doing that is separating those things reduces your personal liability if something happens to your business. Correct. Um, Rachel asks, I'll be filing business taxes for the first time this year. Could you talk about how the owner's initial investment, the startup money, will be treated for tax purposes? Is this a partnership or a corporation? What's the entity? Yep, Rachel, I guess the answer is there's never a straight answer. Single owner LLC. It would just be your money put into the, the business. If you want to put it on as um, like a loan partner or loan back to you, just so you know what money you've put into the business. Um, you know, if at a later time the business um, profits and grows and expands where you want to put money back out for yourself, to get your startup money back, that is fine. You can put it on that way as a loan, you know, a draw or not a draw, but, um, you know, partner with investment or whatever, how that, whatever you want to, uh, uh, I'm trying to say what I'm trying to say, whatever, however you want to summarize it on books. So just noting that your startup money into your business was $20,000 because you may have taken out a personal loan because the business isn't fully up and running to operate yet. So you use a personal loan to get into the business to get it to go. Okay, yeah, so it would just be about how you classify that and then how you determine how it gets paid back to yourself. Correct. 
Great. Um, let me see if I missed anybody. If you don't take an honors draw, can you add it to, can you add it as a liability to your balance sheet as something that is owed? I haven't seen anybody that's done. So it just be, it would just flow to your, um, on a, a sole proprietor or whatever, it would just everything would be just flowing to your, um, your 40 and everything on from a tax perspective, but. Um, I don't see how you put it on as a liability unless you're not um, in a partnership that you're leaving it in there, but then it would come back in as back as a contribution, like on a partnership. So if that's what they're looking at from, you know, a different entity that way. Okay. Um, Kareem asks, I run a general partnership I understand as a carry through entity, I pay taxes on my percent of the net profit. In addition, do I pay self employment tax on that portion of my owner's draw? Whatever would be that. Uh, if you're on the partnership, you're paying the tax that way. And whatever goes to you personally uh, out of it, along with whatever if you're uh, married or whatever is going to play um, into that. So everybody's situation will be different based on family situation um, from that way. I, I, it's it's kind of a loaded question with uh, multiple um, endings with depending on each body, everybody's situation. Wow, I mean, accounting is uh, much much more intricate and unique. <laughs> For every person that I imagine. Um, when you're talking about taxes and what they're trying to accomplish with their business or the different entities, it really is based on that individual's um, what's all going on with them. Yeah. That, so that's um, that brings me to somebody asked a moment ago if you guys will be available um, if somebody if, if folks just want to email you a quick question about this sort of thing. Is that all right? That would be fine. Okay, great. Um, I'll try to put your email addresses in the chat at the end. Um, <clears throat> uh, Sharon asks, to keep from impacting my personal taxes, would it be best to acquire a state ID to use on a W-9? I assume that like uh, an employment an EIN. Well, if you're already operating as a business um, and have wages, you're going to have an EIN. If you're not, then it would be just your social security. So you would want to prevent um, change in business, you know, later down the road that they're from initially using your social security to your EIN, then it would be a wise decision if that's how you feel that your business will grow. Um, to start it and get it initially, um, so you're just ahead of the game. But most of the time, when you're if you're doing that and creating an entity, you're going to create yourself an EIN um, in the beginning um, with the the legal workup. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, Courtney asks, what's the benefit of classifying? A purchase for a car used to deliver farm products as an asset that depreciates versus an expense that comes off the bottom line. Um, also, well, there's a second part about mortgage. Um, can can they deduct any part of the mortgage since they farm on the land under that mortgage? So first part was, is there a benefit to classifying the purchase for a car that's used to deliver farm products as an asset that depreciates versus as an expense that comes straight off the bottom line? It's gonna depend on, again, your situation, your tax situation. So depending on if you take the asset in full or if you expense it over time. And a lot of taxpayers don't do uh, 
uh, they like to prefer to depreciate it if you're going to use it in your business operation over time, unless you've paid for it in cash all up front. If you've got a note and you're continually making your monthly payments on it, they don't want to completely depreciate it out. Um, and then a year later, you're still paying on it and you sell it because then you got all the depreciation recapture and that's a, that's a whole nother story. Yeah, that makes sense. So then similarly, then what, what about the mortgage? Can, can you deduct part of the mortgage if you farm on the land that's on that mortgage? I, I'm assuming you're just talking the house. I do not know. I mean, what, I don't know. Can you speak to if the house versus the land that's not the house? The interest that's paid, you'd be able to, a lot of times what they'll do is take a personal exemption for um, the interest, uh, the real estate taxes, you know, utilities, they'll take a lot of times tax preparers will um, siphon off percentage um, for those expenses for your personal and the rest will be considered a uh, business expense because it's all related to the farm or your business if that's where you um, are working. So it's kind of how each um, bearer will look at it as well as um, you given the information to your tax preparer. I mean, if it's part of the land and everything, yes, you'll be able to write that off. If you're purchasing land for your business to grow, that interest will be, but the, the home mortgage a lot of times will be a percentage because you still have personal expenses within your own uh, house um, that are related to your personal side versus the business side. Okay. Um, Rachel asks, if money is tight and operation revenue costs are small, at what point, <laughs> I assume this is going to be another, like, it's a unique personal situation. Um, at what point do you recommend doing accounting and taxes DIY, like on your own with a tax accounting software versus hiring a professional? Yeah, unfortunately, that <laughs> it, it depends on how comfortable you are with um, keeping your own records and your own information, or is it something that really you don't know a lot of, or you don't know what maybe your taxpayer is asking for and stuff like that. So it really is your own comfort level on if you have the ability or want to keep your own record. Um, okay, Courtney has a follow-up on the mortgage question. Um, can I deduct a percentage of the mortgage just like I can deduct a percentage of house utilities since it's a home-based business and the mortgage is for the house and the land altogether? Yes, you'd be able to just remember um, down the road, uh, two or three years down the road, you are going to um, find a larger place with land for your operation. I don't know if you're, you know, I'm just thinking of a, a small CSA or something to that effect. Um, you will um, have to pay or recapture your depreciation and all that on that business side of the home and everything. So I won't the the you won't receive the full benefits of uh, the capital gains on the home from a tax end of it. Gotcha. Um. Okay, that is all that we have in the chat right now, and we are five minutes to the end. So I think it's probably a good good time to start wrapping things up unless there's any last minute pleas for advice or clarification. Um, I'm gonna, sh gonna share my screen again, just to see my thank you slides. <laughs> All right. Um, it never wants to advance when I want it to. Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Christy and Daniel. I really appreciate you sharing um, this information with us. Uh, Christy and Daniel will be back next Tuesday at 8 a.m. to go even further into record keeping. Um, so I'm sure uh, they'll be able to answer a lot, a lot of your questions again next week. Um, but do keep in mind your personal situation is your own personal situation and it may require personal investigation. <laughs> Um, I'd like to uh, once again thank the Roots to Farm Alliance for helping to support this uh, series and making it possible. You can find their upcoming events at rootstofarm.org. And thank you so much to Compere Financial for providing uh, these amazing presentations. Uh, you can find resources at their website at compere.com. I am going to launch a um, I was going to launch a poll, but now my computer is saying I cannot do that. Um, all right, well, scrap that then. Uh, this, I will say this, well, there it goes. The poll should have launched, I guess. Um, that is just a, a, to explain or to rate the quality of today's presentation and to see if you've got the information that you were looking for. So please take a second to answer that poll. Um, oh, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, and uh, the final thing, this presentation was recorded um, and we will be posting it to our website at thelandconnection.org if you, and then I'll be sending out the recording to everybody that registered as well. Um, if you have any follow-up questions in the meantime, feel welcome to reach back out to me. Um, my email address is cassidy at thelandconnection.org. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you all bright and early next Tuesday at 8 a.m. So thank you so much. Thanks, Dan and Christy. Thank you. Thank you.